Hi and welcome to Film3.UK Movie Recap. Today, we will be reviewing the movie Citizen Kane, 1941. So if you're a fan of the film or just curious about it, stick around. In our video reviews, we may include some spoilers, so please be careful if you haven't seen the movie yet. In the first part of the film, we are introduced to the character of Charles Foster Kane. We see him as a young boy, living in poverty with his mother. His mother is shown to be a very religious woman who is devoted to her son. Kane's father is shown to be a drunken man who is constantly fights with his wife. One day, Kane's father leaves the family and Kane's mother is left to raise her son alone. Kane is then sent to live with his Aunt Emma in New York. At his Aunt Emma's house, Kane is well cared for and he attends a prestigious private school. Kane is a very bright student and he quickly becomes friends with his cousin, Walter. Kane and Walter grow up together and eventually attended college together. One day, after college, Kane and Walter decide to go into business together. They start a newspaper called the New York Inquirer. Kane is very successful in his new business and he quickly becomes one of the most powerful men in New York. However, Kane's happiness is short-lived as his mother becomes ill and dies. Kane is devastated by his mother's death and he blames his father for leaving the family. Kane then turns his back on his father and vows to never forgive him. In the second part of Citizen Kane, Charles Foster Kane's news empire is in full swing. He has bought the New York Inquirer and has turned it into a sensationalist tabloid. He is also in the process of building a massive new office building, which will house all of his newspapers. Meanwhile, Kane's marriage to his first wife, Emily Norton, is beginning to unravel. She is tired of his constant infidelity and his obsession with his work. Kane also begins to distance himself from his best friend, Jedediah Leland. Leland is critical of Kane's new business ventures and Kane is tired of Leland's constant moralizing. Kane continues to have affairs with various women, including his mistress, Susan Alexander. Susan is an aspiring singer who Kane is attempting to turn into an opera star. However, her performances are disastrous and the public ridicules her. Kane's marriage to Emily finally comes to an end and she leaves him. Kane is devastated by the breakup of his marriage and becomes even more obsessed with his work. Kane's business empire begins to collapse when the stock market crashes in 1929. Kane is forced to sell off his assets, including the Inquirer. However, he refuses to give up control of his office building and ends up bankrupt. Kane's once close friend Leland now despises him and writes a scathing article about him and the Inquirer. Kane is now a ruined man, both financially and emotionally. The third part of Citizen Kane begins with a newspaper montage, followed by a scene in which Kane's wife, Susan, visits a doctor. She is told that she is suffering from a nervous condition and is advised to take a vacation. Kane refuses to let her go, and the couple argues. Kane then fires his wife's singing teacher, Mr. Gill, and hires a new one, Mr. Thatcher. Thatcher tells Kane that Susan is not ready to sing publicly yet. Kane and Susan attend a party thrown by Thatcher, where Kane meets a young woman named Marion Davis. Davis accepts Kane's invitation to dinner, and the two begin an affair. Thatcher resigns after Kane refuses to listen to his advice about Susan's singing career. Kane runs for governor, but his campaign is derailed when Davis is caught in a compromising position with another man. Kane loses the election, and Davis breaks off their relationship. Susan leaves Kane and files for divorce. Kane becomes increasingly isolated and paranoid, and he withdraws from all involvement in his businesses. He spends his days roaming around his empty mansion, Xanadu. One day, he comes across a room full of Kane's possessions from his childhood, and he has a flashback to his days as a newsboy. The fourth part of the film Citizen Kane, 1941, begins with Kane hiring a new assistant, Jerry Thompson, to help him with his work. Thompson is a reporter who is familiar with Kane's past. Kane tells Thompson that he wants him to write a story about his life, from his childhood onwards. Kane then takes Thompson to his childhood home, where he shows him the bedroom that he shared with his mother. Kane tells Thompson about his mother's death and how it affected him. Kane then takes Thompson to meet his second wife, Susan Alexander. Kane and Susan have a disagreement about Susan's career, Kane wants her to be a singer, but Susan wants to be an actress. Kane and Susan's relationship deteriorates and they eventually divorce. Kane becomes increasingly depressed and withdraws from society. One night, Kane goes to the opera with his mistress, Marion Davis. He falls asleep in his box and is booed by the audience. Davis tries to cheer in Kane up, but he is unresponsive. Kane then returns to his childhood home, where he dies alone. The fifth part of Citizen Kane begins with Kane's second wife, Susan, trying to stop him from buying the New York Inquirer. 
she fails, and Kane begins to distance himself from her. He spends more and more time at work, and Susan starts drinking heavily. One night, Kane comes home to find her drunk and disorderly. He tries to take her to see a psychiatrist, but she refuses. Kane then has her committed to a mental institution. While Susan is away, Kane begins an affair with a young singer, Emily Norton. He sets her up in an apartment and pays for her singing lessons. Emily falls in love with Kane, but he does not reciprocate her feelings. One night, Kane and Emily attend a party at the home of Charles Foster Kane's friend, Jed Leland. There, Kane meets Jed's niece, Mary, and they dance together. Kane falls in love with Mary and proposes to her. She accepts, and they marry. Kane and Mary move to Xanadu, Kane's palatial estate. There, Kane builds a private zoo and a massive art collection. He also builds a hydroelectric dam and a railway line to the property. Meanwhile, Susan remains in the mental institution, where she eventually dies. Kane opens his first newspaper, The Inquirer. The public hates it. He then buys a failing rival paper, The New York Chronicle. He spends lavishly to make The Chronicle a success, including an unsuccessful attempt to become governor. In a last-ditch effort to keep the paper afloat, Kane backs William Randolph Hearst's congressional campaign. When Hearst is defeated, Kane loses control of The Chronicle. Of the film The Seventh Part of Citizen Kane begins with Charles Foster Kane's election campaign for governor. Kane's campaign is in full swing and he is confident that he will win. However, his opponents are starting to catch up to him in the polls. Meanwhile, Kane's wife, Susan, is becoming increasingly frustrated with her husband's obsession with winning. She feels that he is neglecting her in their marriage. Kane's campaign takes a turn for the worse when his opponents begin to use his personal life against him. They paint him as a man who is inattentive to his wife and who only cares about himself. Kane's popularity begins to wane and he starts to lose support from his own party. The final straw comes when Kane's opponents release a damaging video of him that was taken during an extramarital affair. The video destroys Kane's chances of winning the election and he is forced to concede defeat. After the election, Kane's marriage falls apart and Susan leaves him. Kane is left alone in his massive mansion, completely alone and isolated from the world. In the eighth part of the film, Kane's wife, Susan, leaves him and returns to her home in New York. Kane is left alone in his big, empty house. He wander around aimlessly, and eventually comes across a room that he has never seen before. Inside, he finds a portrait of himself as a young boy, sitting in a field of sunflowers. Wounded and alone, Kane wanders through his empty mansion, finally coming to rest in his bedroom. There, he stares at a snow globe, and the camera closes in on his face as he whispers Rosebud. Orson Welles's film Citizen Kane, 1941, is divided into ten parts. The tenth part of the film takes place after Charles Foster Kane's death, when his loyal butler, Mr. Bernard, goes through Kane's belongings in his room at Xanadu. Bernard finds a locked box with a piece of paper that says Rosebud on it. He opens the box and finds a snow globe with a house inside it. He then puts the globe back in the box and locks it. 